Okay. Welcome in, everybody. Welcome to 11 o'clock. I'm Ivan. This is Facebook. This is Zoom. This is the 11 o'clock class on Tuesday, the 19th. Hair care product use and application, specifically for men's hair, but it applies to just about anybody and everybody. Um, and please know, this was a subject... I got an email from a viewer, from a member of the community, asking to hear about this, see about this, learn about this, talk about this, and I said, sure, let's do it. So we scheduled it into this week, we slotted it in for today, uh, and that's what we are going to talk about. I want to, uh, as we always do, make sure Facebook world is here yeah it's here I'm here you're here uh, we always start out by acknowledging and giving a shout out to our friends at Barbicide sanitation and infection control for the professional beauty and barber industry hey everybody give me a thumbs up if you are Barbicide certified either use the thumb function or say the word thumb or comment the word thumb in one of our footprints here let's make sure we know you are Barbicide certified if you're not there yet Got to get there. Uh, COVID-19 certification. If you're an owner or you got a business, uh, we have the safe uh, establishment certification. That's another one that you can get uh, from Barbicide as well so that you are up to date, uh, so that you are learning, so that you are earning, so that you, your clients, your business, and your reputation are, as always, protected well. The back to work plan and the reopening recommendations document. Those are free downloads that are available online at barbicide.com. I have them in my links on my Instagram profile as well. So you're welcome to go there for easy access to those documents uh, so that you're up to date, so that you're informed, and so that you are ready to go. $100,000 hair cutter, that's our tradition. You know we always start here. Who's got a day for me? Somebody throw out a day so that we can look at $100,000 hair cutter. We'll do two, we'll do one from Zoom and one from Facebook. So if you are on Facebook, any day of the year, pick a day of the year. Quincy, welcome in Quincy, 8-4, August 4. August, I went way past August, got all the way to September. Slow my roll, here we go. Day, August 4, day 16, 149 days remaining in the year. Brand yourself. Branding is defined as the process of creating a unique name and image of your business, product, or service in the minds of the consumer. Very important to understand, branding does not exist in your logo. Branding is what you are in the mind of a consumer. It may be an extension of your logo, your name, and some of those things. You'd better be branding yourself. Everyone cuts hair. How does a consumer spot you within the marketplace of hair cutters offering haircuts? How does a consumer remember you from amongst all the haircuts they have experienced? How will you remain top of mind the next time it is time to get a haircut? The answer to all of these questions is to be found in your unique brand. Branding is your logo. Branding is the font you use in your printed communications. Branding is the tone and the feel of your social media presence. Your branding is what sets you apart. I could go on for a few pages, but I think you get the idea. Your brand should be clear. Your brand should be consistent. Your brand should be uniquely you. You know, there are lots of books at the library when we can go to the library. In the meantime, go online, digital, go to Amazon. Lots of books out there on building your brand, creating your brand. It's very much a buzzword, I think, today for a lot of people in our industry and on social media to be talking about working on their brand or focusing on their brand or developing their brand. Some aspects of branding are things that you do maybe even without thinking about it. And some other aspects of your brand are things that you are very, very deliberate in crafting. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some important distinctions there. But um, knowing who you are um, and defining that in the mind and in the eye of your cons customers, I think becomes very important. Let's see if we got a date offered up by the folks at Facebook. Uh, 
Okay, let me just see here. Wyoming checking in. Good to have you. Monica's here as always. Monica's a regular. You're welcome. Um, Miguel says August 2. All right, here's a thumb. Here's a thumb. Here's a thumb. We like all that interaction. Um, Tyler asked a question. Can you review again the products we would use during a haircut before cutting the top? We can talk about that. Tyler, bring that question up uh, a little bit later as we get into the program, uh, and we can review that specific to top cutting. But I think there's a lot of choices for uh, cutting with product in the hair. We'll talk about that definitely. August 2 was uh, Miguel's request. Let's turn to August 2 for a second reading from $100,000 Haircutter. You know, it's such a part of our tradition. August 2, day 214, 151 days remaining in the year. Now, in our last class, somebody had picked the date that talked about handshaking. And we talked about handshaking being such a coronavirus no-no. Well, here's where we flip the script in the total, total opposite direction. You hear me, Roger? Here we go. August 2, day 214, 151 days remaining in the year. Accept credit and debit cards. We live in the age of virtual money. Plastic is faster, safer, and easier to handle. Clients will spend more when they spend on a card. Phone app-based credit card clearing services are easy to use and the rates are lower than ever before. There are no reasons left not to take credit and debit cards for haircuts. Cash will be vanishing before the end of your career. The sooner you get on board with plastic for payment, the faster your business will grow. Business transacted on credit cards provides valuable tracking information, records, and accountability. Let's break this down a little bit. Let's talk about taking credit cards on a couple of levels. Number one, in the coronavirus world, we don't want to touch dirty money. That's pretty simple. We want to speed up the transaction process. Click, click. Um, I've heard in the discussion with like Booksy, the app that I work with, and by the way, if you're not on Booksy and you need to be taking appointments and you need to be going to an app, you got to go to Booksy. My Booksy link is in my profile and my code is my name, Ivan Zoot, gets you free Booksy until July. You can log on, you can set up your profile, you can start using Booksy immediately and you don't have to pay for it for like six weeks, which is awesome. Um, but Booksy's goal is what we'll call Uberization of the transaction. For those of you that have ever used a ride share, an Uber or a Lyft, um, you click, click to order the car, you click, click when you're done to pay, you click, click to review the driver and you're gone. There's no money, we don't even talk about the money. I don't think I've ever discussed the cost of the fare with an Uber driver. You simply get out of the car. It's done. You pay and it's gone. And I think we're going there with haircuts in a big way. Again, another aspect of taking credit cards. And, you know, let's get out in front of it. Let's let's say it. Let's talk about it. Let's acknowledge it. The days of talking about the haircut business as a cash business under the table and off the books are gone. You just can't work that way anymore. You gotta record all your income, you gotta report all your income, you gotta pay tax on all your income. You've got to play this business 100% legit. And I'll make the point of acknowledging, guys, ladies out there who can hear me, there are a lot of hair cutters that had a pretty rough and pretty rude awakening when coronavirus shut down our business because immediately none of them qualified for any of the government funded support. None of them qualified. If they were off the books, if you were playing illegitimately, you didn't qualify for a stimulus check. You didn't get Corona money. You didn't get anything. You don't qualify for the loans for businesses. You don't qualify for unemployment. You got nothing because you never gave anything because you were hiding money, because you were ducking the tax man, because you were undercutting the business, because you weren't playing legit. And in many ways, many of those hair cutters, many of those hair cutters that weren't playing legit, that got no support through all of this, will be leaving the industry. They will not be coming back when we go back to business. So that idea of off the books and under the table has come back to bite them hard on the back end.
And there's a huge lesson to be learned from that. Let's not make those mistakes again. So let's take plastic, let's track our business, let's record our business, let's be legitimate business people, let's run this business the way we're supposed to run this business, and we'll all thrive, and we'll all survive, and we'll all succeed in a very big way. So taking plastic today in our industry, it's a non-starter. It's not even a discussion. It's not even a conversation. We even talk about it in 100 by 100. 100 new haircut customers in 100 days guaranteed. Taking plastic is part of appealing to new customers. You know, there are a lot of young people that just don't take cash anywhere. They don't have cash with them. They pay with their phone and they pay with their card and they pay with Venmo and they pay with so many of these other electronic financial transaction tools that the industry of cash is long gone and it's over. The other two books we always talk about, Big and Bigger. Big Busy Barbershop, Bigger Busy Barbershop, the two books set, year one, year two, weeks one through 52, 53 through 104, to build and grow your business. And don't forget, now we have the four books set. All four books, one low price with a big fat discount, and paper, ready to rock. Go online, get your books, order your books today. All right, let's get into our program. Our program today is product application. And it came about as a question talking about, hey, how do we know which product to use, when and where, for what style, to get what look, and to get what effect? So I've got some tips here. Got a list of about eight things that I hope to cover with the time that we have to talk about this subject. Because I think a lot of hair cutters get confused and it shouldn't be confusing, it should be simple. A lot of hair cutters, because they don't know what to do, they do nothing in this category. And I cannot emphasize enough how important product sales is to your long-term success and profitability in the business. And again, lessons from coronavirus. When we go back, we're already hearing this from shops that are already back. When we go back, we're gonna be slower. Not demand, productivity. We're gonna be handling fewer clients per hour. We're gonna be moving more slowly through those haircuts in the shop. That's gonna cost us money. That's gonna cost us dollars per hour in productivity. And the way we make up the difference is with product. Ah, uh, what does Sarah say? There you go. Yeah, and as an independent contractor, Sarah offered up a comment here about being an independent contractor who didn't show all the money that was made, which created a compromise situation later. As an employee, as an independent contractor, as a booth renter who's essentially running your own business, you've got to take the books a thousand percent legit. So we're going to find out we're running behind. Previously, we did two haircuts an hour. Now we're down to one. We're moving slower than we ever did. And of course, Zoom just tanked. Apologies, guys. We're gonna try to reboot. Facebook, hang with me just a minute while we restart reboot. We'll be there. But product is gonna close the gap for us because if your haircut productivity is down, and you go from two to one haircut per hour, how are you gonna make up the difference? If haircut clients are walking out the door with products, are taking products with them, then you're gonna have the additional bottom line revenue that product provides, and you're also gonna have the increased profitability that product provides. And this is a not too subtle reality of the dollars that we do in the business. A $20 haircut at 6% profit may leave you with about $2 profit if you're lucky and doing well. You're gonna have a couple of bucks profit. Six to 10% profit will leave you with a couple of bucks. But a $20 product is gonna leave you with about $7 in profitability bottom line when you're done. So the difference between the bottom line profitability 
of hair care product versus the bottom line profitability of haircut services can be huge without putting too fine a point on it. You really want to be sure that you're going to get product dollars when we're going to get our retail dollars uh, or when we're going to get our service dollars. You're going to need it. Product will close the gap for you. And the truth of the matter is, if you don't welcome back Zoom, if you don't have product dollars, you're going to be in trouble because those product dollars are so vital for your bottom line. So that's the big reason on uh, why I think product is so important and why I, I, we need to see haircut professionals running, running to product opportunity. All right, first on our list, let's talk about categories. We got gel. We got paste. We got wax. We got cream. We got hard wax. We have pomade. There's so many, there's clay. There's so many different categories of short hair styling product. There's mousses. There's so many things. However, there's not as many things as it appears. And a lot of times there's confusion created in the interest of marketing. Brands and manufacturers want to have new names for things, new descriptions for things, new titles for products. Now I want to show you something. This is Style Cream. This is Power Gel. This is Classic Wax. And this is Matte Paste. And their ingredient lists are very different. But on all four of these, the first ingredient is water. And point number one here is understanding these product categories and what they're designed to do. Is it designed to create hold or is it designed to create texture? That's the real distinction in these categories, not so much what is in the jars themselves. You really need to ask yourself, what am I asking the hair to do? And I think that's how we divide up the categories. Is it a hold product? You know, what we'll call um, a placement, putting the hair where I want it to go, or is it a texture product? Is it about the look and the feel of the hair more so than its positioning? Because while these are both water-based products, their impact, their result, their look, and their feel on the hair is going to be very, very different. So after we talk about those categories, are we looking to hold hair in some way, or are we looking to adapt the way the hair looks and feels? That's one. Number two is the water or not question. You've got to ask yourself, is it water-based or not? What's the first ingredient? This is a wax. Clipper Guy wax. This is a wax. John Amico stick up wax. This I call a light formula wax or a soft wax. It's light and it's soft. That's why I call it that. This is absolutely in a push up stick, a hard wax formulation. The big difference between the two is the first ingredient. The first ingredient in this wax is water. The first ingredient in this wax is oil. They're going to behave very, very differently. And let's talk about why water is the factor. As you know, water is responsible for breaking the hydrogen bonds in hair. When hair is wet, it behaves in its natural texture. Wet hair, curly hair curls up. Wavy hair waves up. Now we can blow that hair dry straight and we can flat iron that hair dry straight and we can style that hair straight. But as soon as it gets wet, it's going to revert. So as an example, if I'm blowing up the front edge of a flat top or the top of a pompadour, if I'm getting on a haircut and we're going to get a haircut over here to talk about, if I'm getting on a haircut, and I want that front edge high and tall. I would wet the hair and then I would get a blow dryer and I would dry the hair and I would be pulling it up as I dried it. I would be drying and pulling and drying and pulling and drying and pulling. 
and I use, and I'm going to go grab a dryer so I can actually do this. Hang on with me here just a second. The key to understanding how product is going to behave is really the key of understanding how water causes hair to behave. Because the water question is what's going to let you experiment with your products and the water question is what's going to help you to choose the right product for a different style in different situations. Alright, got my blow dryer plugged in. So I wet that hair. I don't need a lot of water in it. I want to blow that pump up. Now, I go with hot air and I go with a lot of air, uh, heat and wind. Heat and wind. Now, I'm blowing it hot and I'm blowing it hot and I'm blowing it hot. I'm pulling it straight up and I'm blowing it hot and I'm blowing it hot. Now, when I want to put a bend in the hair, you'll see me pull the dryer away. I'm going to do this with the dryer off so you can hear me. I hold that hair up and I blow hot, 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 hot. And when I hold it up there, hot, 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 then I drop the dryer. When I drop the dryer, ambient air rushes in, air cooler than the dryer, and it puts that bend in the hair. So I got a nice little bend in the hair. I'm going to exaggerate the bend now. Watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a hard crimp in the hair, at the front of the hair like that. High and hot. Watch. Hot, hot, hot. Pull it away. Cool. I can either pull it away or I can use the cool shot button. See the crimp I just put in there? I put that bend or that crease in the front of the hair like that as a hard crimp into the front of the hair. That is very different from the soft blow that I put in there initially and that is a result of the cool air. Hot air bends hair, cool air locks it in place. Now I'm going to straighten that out. I'm going to take that bend right out of it. I pull the dryer away and the air cools. Now, if I have created that tall front on there, and I want that to stay high and tall like that for my style. I do not want to use a styling product like a gel. Now is not the time to put the gel in. If I wanted that nice and tall, I would have put the gel in when the hair was wet and I would have used the gel to support the blow dry coming in here. And by the way, there was a little bit of gel in there. So that's what we got. But what happens if I gel this right now? Can anybody tell me what happens if I put gel in my hand, gel, water-based gel, gel in my hand and I gel the hair? And this is exactly what happens to my hair every day because my hair left on its own has wave to it. But I like to blow my flat top up and nice and tall and square. Can anybody tell me what will happen if I put gel on that right now? You know what's going to happen? It's going to revert. That's exactly what's going to happen. It's going to collapse and it's going to fall and you're going to lose it. What you need to do now to keep this looking the way you want it is you need to put in something that is not water based. So of the choices I have here, I have my wax stick. This would be perfect. I can use this wax stick. Now, if it was my own stick at home, I can use it directly on my head. But we don't do that in the shop. You would put this onto your hand and then put it into the hair, as long as it's only yours. But as soon as more than one person is going to use this, for instance, if this wax is on the counter to be shared by a bunch of barbers in the shop, you don't want to put your finger in there anymore. Now you can see a big finger mark in there because I put my finger in there because it's my wax. But if you're going to be putting more than one finger in there, 
you got to go to popsicle sticks. We used to call them popsicle sticks because popsicles came on these sticks. Now we call them craft sticks. You can get a bag of a thousand of these at the hobby store for pennies. And that's how you take product out of the jar. You take product out of the jar using a brand new clean stick. You go in, you take it out. Now there's a couple reasons why we use this this way. Number one, it keeps the jar clean. That's a sanitation issue. And post-coronavirus world, it's going to be even more important. Number two, this is how we show clients that's how much you use on the stick. That's how much you use. And then we put it in our hand, and then we put it in the hair. I'm going to wash my hands. It's no problem. That's exactly how we're going to work with that. So using the sticks, and by the way, I have a little half one here. Somebody made the comment when we talked about sticks a week or two ago, cut them in half. I just snap them in half with a wire cutter, and that's all you need. You can be even more efficient with these. They cost literally pennies. Um, and you can use very, you know, just a little one like that is perfect for taking, you know, especially this is a paste that's a much harder formulation. Perfect for taking paste right out of the jar with a brand new, fresh, clean stick. So, water or not, in this case, it's going to be very important that the product is um, not water-based if I want to style this like this after I've blown it dry. I want to use a product that is not water-based. Now, let's pause for a minute and talk just a little bit about that water or not conversation when it comes to some products. If you go online, I think on Facebook there's a pomade group on Facebook and some of these pomade fans, some of these pomade users can get pretty militant. They're pretty passionate about their pomades. There are pomade collectors who own hundreds of jars of pomades. And one of the debates that we get into on that site sometimes is the question of, is it an oil-based or a water-based pomade? And one of the funny things that happens in that conversation is, the real hardcore pomade guys will tell you, and I think there's some truth to this, that there's no such thing as water-based pomade. Pomades traditionally are oil-based. And these guys believe, and I kind of agree with them, as soon as you formulate it with water, it's a gel. It's a different kind of gel. It may be a different hold, and it may be a different texture, and it may be a different shine, and it may be a different pliability. But as soon as it's got water in the formula, in the recipe, boom, it's a gel. You can't really call it a pomade anymore. So as an example, this is classic wax. This is hard wax. The hard wax is oil-based. It is not going to revert the hair when it makes contact with the hair. This classic wax, because the first ingredient is water, the instant you put this in the hair, yes, it's going to hold, yes, it's a wax, it's going to seal, but it's immediately going to revert the hair. You're going to get some loss of height. You're going to get some collapse in the body that you built into it. You're going to get some change to that style. So the question of water or not is a reality in this discussion. So really, that's a water-based gel, that's a water-based wax, that's a water-based paste, that's a water-based cream. All of these will provide differences in style and texture. The cream is an example, and I mean, here you look. The wax is more clear, the cream is more opaque, and the paste has a much sort of drier and grittier feel to it. However, in all four of these examples, all four of these products have water as the first ingredient. That means it's the greatest ingredient there. The, the ingredient lists vary in length, and the positioning of certain items varies within what's going on in there. This cream, if you read the ingredients, is actually more of a wax in terms of what's going on in there. This cream is beautiful for not straight, but hair that has some wave and curl. You get wonderful separation, you get wonderful texture, you get wonderful pliability. 
So it's really about experimenting with the product. We've talked about using spatulas or using uh, popsicle sticks in uh, our pucks and jars. We've talked about using it as an opportunity to show the customer or the client just how much we're going to use. So let's talk about these items. Let's forget about the fact that they're water or oil. And let's talk about what is traditionally expected of these things within their categories. Gels traditionally can vary in hold. We have light gel, medium gel, firm gel, ultra firm gel, and at the high end of ultra firm gel, we have the hair glues. I used, back in the 90s, I was a hair glue guy, because man, I wanted rock hard, and I wanted tall, and I wanted it sticking up. Loved my hair glue, and there were several that I used, and a lot of those, they were water-based, but, and I, some of these, I even have one that we have in our John Amico line, um, it's called hair glue. And what we do with that one is we turn the faucet on before we put it in our hands. Because once we put it in our hands and we put it in our hair, we don't want to have to touch the handle on the sink to get our hands wet because most of them are water soluble. They'll break down, break away in water, and a little bit of soap, a little bit of detergent, a little bit of shampoo will completely remove them from the hair. So that's your gel category. Your gels can vary. Most of them have shine. And there's a difference between putting a gel on a dry hair versus on wet hair. When you put gel into wet hair, you can air dry. You put gel into wet hair and you do what's called wet sculpting. You'll put that gel in wet hair, you'll comb and distribute it as you wish, and you'll leave it alone and you'll let it air dry. That is generally done with gels that are either the rock hard ones where you just want that stiff solid look or the more medium hold ones where you want some positioning again gel for positioning the light hold gels are more used underneath when you go in and roller set or blow dry you put it into damp hair and then you apply heat to it uh, to activate and to hold it shine levels generally speaking gels that are air dried will be shinier then once you blow dry them, you'll blow dry a lot of that shine out of them. You won't see the shine from a lot of gels. Let's talk about waxes. We have two that we're talking about here. This is a light wax. This is a water-based wax. This wax is going to create softness. Wax will never really dry in the hair. And if you put wax on dry hair, you will literally waterproof the style. If you blow dry a flat top up, with some gel, and then you put wax on a flat top, you can go out in the rain. You can go out in a hurricane. It's not gonna fall, it's not gonna collapse, and even if you come in wet, your hair will still be up because you've sealed the hair. It's like waxing the surface of your car. That being said, if you put wax, hard or soft formula, in hair that is not fully dry, you'll seal the water in. And now, you put wax in a damp pompadour, it'll never stand up. It'll always be soft and collapse. If you want that look where it's just kind of falling and drooping on you, that's a great way to get that kind of look by literally, the hair is slightly dampened, and then when you put that wax in it, my jar, my finger, when you put that wax in hair that is slightly dampened, you're literally sealing that wax into the hair. And when and it's gonna flop and it's gonna fall and it's gonna lay. Notice we started seeing bend and things like that. We added a little bit of water in there, but the water that's in that product will impact the way that's going to lay and fall and look. So that's wax on wet hair or wax on dry hair. In the pomade category, you've got to really ask yourself when you pick up a pomade, the first thing you should be doing, and I don't have a true pomade here within my group of products. Truth be known, Ivan's not much of a pomade guy. I don't like, certainly don't like oil-based pomades uh, for my hair because my hair is too fine for oil-based pomades. Mm -hmm. And because of the styles I wear, there's not a lot of use for me for oil-based pomades. But oil-based pomades are gonna stay soft and they're gonna be restylable and they're gonna have a lot of pliability to them. 
However, oil-based pomades do not revert the hair because they're not water. So when you go in and blow dry, and now that I have a little more wax in this, if I get out waxed hair with a blow dryer, boy, remember that front that I blew up? This is gonna be even taller and smoother because now I'm using heat See how that picked up a little bit of shine? And it picked up. Now from the wax combined with the heat, we've got that a little bit taller and a little bit smoother and a little bit slickier because I've kind of softened or melted that wax into the hair. With your pomades, water or oil. If it's water-based, it's gonna revert the hair a bit. If it's oil-based, it's not. So if you've got a guy that you cut a pump that's got wavy hair, and you blow out a pump on wavy hair, oil-based pomade, not a water-based product. I could use an oil-based wax or an oil-based pomade, but as the instant I put this style cream on that pump, the hair's gonna revert, and you're probably gonna be disappointed unless that was the result you were looking for. Last in the category are some of your pastes. And pastes can be, pastes are generally your matte products. This particular one is called matte paste. It's not, it doesn't have any shine to it. If you put it in wet hair, it's gonna stay very soft. It's really not gonna dry. Pastes are generally not designed for wet hair. Pastes are designed for final styling. They're not about hold, they're about texture. Pastes are about how does the hair feel. Some people really don't like paste type products because the hair feels dirty. Some people love these kind of products, the pastes and the clays, because for them, really clean hair doesn't style very well. They absolutely have to have product in the hair to give it that one day or second day dirty feel or look to create the texture thereafter. My son is an example. My son's hair is a little bit longer now. He, he hates his hair the day that he washes it. Because the day that he washes it, it's my hair, so it's fine. It's my hair, so it's got some wave to it. And it just absolutely goes when it is freshly clean. But one or two days dirty, all of a sudden his hair's got the texture and the feel that he likes. And quite frankly, it looks better that way. So it's about knowing that. That being said, be aware of shampooing these products out. Um, if you're using a lot of oil-based products, you might need two latherings with shampoo. You're probably gonna want a little more of an aggressive detergent shampoo. You're probably gonna want a shampoo that's got a little bit of a higher pH to it to really get that stuff off of the hair to get you going. If you're primarily using water-based product, the water-based products will mostly remove from the hair even just by rinsing. And one light lathering with a reasonably gentle shampoo will take those products out of the hair completely. The last two things on my tip list with regards to product before we go to Q&A, and I hope we got a lot of great Q&A coming from uh, this product discussion because there's so much to talk about when it comes to the unique behavior, characteristics, and specialties of product. Um, you learn by playing. The best way to learn what does or doesn't work is by playing with product. Now, I don't want to go too far down the product knowledge rabbit hole because I know people, I have friends in the business, who if you say to them, phenoxyl ethanol, phenoxyl ethanol, that's right there, or Ethyly, ethyl, I can't even pronounce this. Ethyl hexyglycerin. I don't know what the heck that is. Um, there should be a good one here. Uh, we have Ceterate 20. We have Polysorbate 60. We have Capi, Cap, Caprihydroxomic acid, maybe, I don't know. I can barely read English when I read this stuff. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to save this class, David. You're going to be able to watch it on replay. 
Um, but my point is this, product knowledge. The best way to learn about products is to play with products. This is what we used to do when I had my shop. When we'd get in a new product, we would get a couple of them as testers. We would label them testers so that everybody knew these were testers. And I would give them to the members of our team and send them home and I would tell them, use this in your hair. Use this in your hair. And I would sometimes get them back and there would be no product missing. There might be a fingerprint in the middle where they put their finger in and took their finger out and they went and they smelled it and they went like this. Hairdressers love to do this. They'll take product out of the jar and they'll go like that and they'll rub it around in their finger. I don't know what the heck they're doing, but they're not gaining information. What you need to really do when you do these things is you need to get it in your hair. And what I used to tell people is, we have shampoo in the back and we have blow dryers in the front. I want you to put this Clipper Guy Classic Wax in your hair. I want every single person that works on our team to put this Clipper Guy Classic Wax in their hair. Now, as soon as I say that, you've got a girl, maybe you've got Jennifer, and Jennifer's got long, thin, fine, blonde hair. And you know that this wax is wrong for her hair. And I know that this wax is wrong for her hair. And Jennifer knows that this wax is wrong for her hair. And I still want Jennifer to put it in her hair. We can shampoo it out. She can style and dry her hair when we're done. But part of understanding product is knowing why this product is the right product for you. And part of understanding product is why, knowing why this product is the wrong product for you. And believe me, when you put a product, when you put this matte paste in four different guys with four different types of hair, you will immediately understand exactly why it's right for him and it's wrong for him and it's good for him and it's not good for him. You know, when people talk about products, hey, that Clipper Guy Power Gel, is that good? Well, it's good for the right thing. It's good for the right client. And there's somebody out there that it's wrong for. And that's where we need to understand this. And this comes down to what I call usable product knowledge. Product knowledge is knowledge, usable product knowledge, is product knowledge gained by using the product. Product knowledge is not reading the label. Yes, I want you to read the label. And I'll tell you, generally, everything you need to know is on the front. This is Clipper Guy by John Amico Power Gel Firm Hold Medium Shine, eight ounces. That's pretty much what you need to know about this product. The only other question is water. Water's the first ingredient, that's on the back, okay? But product knowledge is not memorizing the ingredients. Product knowledge, remove a small portion with fingertips, warm in palms by rubbing, apply to damp or dry hair to create a natural, organized, or chaotic look that will last all day. Now, natural, organized, or chaotic look. That's all about texture. That's not about positioning like your gel. Work a small amount between palms and apply evenly through damp hair, style as desired. We kept that one kind of simple. But usable product knowledge is product knowledge gained from using the product, not from reading the, lab reading the labels. I'm not impressed if you know how to pronounce the ingredients on the back of the jar. I am impressed if you know why this is right for this client and what effect it will have and why this is right for that client and what effect it will have. Have. So the most important aspect of this conversation, <clears throat> the biggest key that I want to give you, the biggest takeaway from all of this is product knowledge gained by using the product, usable product knowledge. You got to learn and you got to play to learn. You got to get the jars open. You got to get the tops off. You got to get your sticks in. You got to get the product out and you got to get it in hair to start to understand how it will participate, how it will what it will produce and what the effects are going to be. All right, guys, Q and A time in the whole product category. What do you got? What do you know? What do you want to know? How can I help you? Let me know. I'm here for chat or audio.
Anybody? Anything? We cover a lot. I try to pack a lot of information into every one of these programs. Does anybody have any product related questions on use or application of hair care product for your clients? For styling, hair, for working with clients with their hair? Anybody? Nobody? All right, while we're thinking of any questions, tomorrow, Wednesday in the morning, skip guard tapering. That's going to be a clipper class. And 11 o'clock is B Green, environmental issues and environmental awareness and environmental initiatives for barbershops and hair salons. How to go green, turning green into green. Green, good for the environment. Green, good for your wallet. So we're going to talk about green on Wednesday. Thursday is Clipper Clinic, episode three, and uh, make it the most of a first time client. This is the topic of the week. So we have a class that is tied to the topic of the week for next week. And then Friday is going to be condensed cutting with a focus on curve comb cutting. If you don't have and you don't use and you don't know all about curve combs for condensed cutting, we're going to cover that on Friday. And then Friday at 11 is going to be tracking and statistics. So those are the classes we have to finish out the week. Any other questions or comments from anybody? All right, guys, you're welcome. Hope you have a great day coming up on 12. It's going to be lunchtime, and we'll see you again right here tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.